and welcome to another episode of Photography Friday. My name is Jane Corley with Pick Visions Media Arts and Photography. If it's your first time here, make sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell so you can be notified every time a new video is uploaded. If you learned something new, make sure to like this video. And today, we are going to talk about the history of photography. I know that sounds kind of boring to a lot of you, but it's really important to understand the road that your fellow photographers have walked in the past in order to better understand ways to manipulate your craft today. So let's get started. First, what is photography? How is it defined? Photography is defined as the imprint or record of an image of a subject or an object through the manipulation of light onto a light sensitive material. Moving on from that, so the Greeks coined the phrase photographirion, which means to draw with light. In the beginning, it was as simple as light passing through a lens and being imprinted onto a photosensitive material. Nowadays, it is much more than that. So going back to the good old days, that imprint of that image actually didn't come out to what looks like images today. It came out as what's called a negative or the reverse imprint of an image. So as light is exposed through the lens of your camera, it's going to detect the highs and the lows, the contrast, the differences based on how much light is reflected back into that lens from that object or subject. So to put it plainly in an example, imagine you're taking a picture of a mountain range. You have the line of the mountain range that goes across that separates the ground from the sky. That is the contrast of light within that image. So your camera or the cameras back then would record the darker and the lighter contrast between those two parts of the image. And as you move on down to the grass and the trees and all that other information within the photo, you're now getting to more or less light and it's able to draw those edges around based on the contrast of what that image is, what's behind that image and what's in front of that image. So those imprints were put on to different plates of light sensitive material in order to produce that negative. That negative was then processed by what's called a fixer in order to convert that negative into a positive. That transformation, depending on the material that you're trying to produce that image on, so whatever kind of paper or glass or clay they were trying to produce that image on, sometimes that result would take hours. Sometimes that result would take weeks weeks y'all but when people were able to produce these images they were now able to record an experience that experience gave traction to photographers gave an authenticity to their craft of ways to record instances from history monarchs evolving on country wars breaking out across country the birth of children that would grow up to be kings and queens. These instances were now able to be recorded and really made photography a powerful weapon back in the day. So when I say back in the day, how far back in the day? Well, about 2000 years ago, it's debated whether China did it or whether Greece did it. But just remember back in Aristotle's time is when camera obscura was invented. Camera obscura is the method of putting yourself and the camera that you're wanting to record this instance of or this person or this subject. Camera obscura was the method of bringing yourself into a dark room without any light pollution exposing a subject or an object 
to light for a small amount of time or an extended amount of time in order to imprint an image through the methods of drawing with light, showing that contrast, showing that difference in color or light refraction back to your lens. Camera Obscura was this cumbersome method of recording these images. It took a giant amount of space, it took a lot of controlled variables, and any beam of light shooting through your Camera Obscura cage really just would ruin your image, ruin the products, ruin the, the financial things that you have put your money into. And it was very expensive to produce photography back in the day. But as photography evolved from Camera Obscura to the different methods further on in history, people started learning how to manipulate light in these smaller spaces. It wasn't until the 16th century when Gambiatista della Porta wrote about Camera Obscura that photography was really born. As photography and methods evolved, heliography, daguerreotypes, and photogenic drawing were born. But really, daguerreotype was the only one that really stuck and was able to be evolved. The next big evolution in photography was wet clay collodion. Now I love wet clay collodion. I think it is such a cool look and if you've never heard of it, take a look at some examples. Just search on your search engines, wet clay collodion, wet plate collodion, and see what it was all about. Wet plate collodion, it took the idea of the camera obscura, a giant dark room that had these cumbersome development methods and really just took it to the next level. So in Instead of imprinting on these massive film documents, wet plate collodion was actually able to imprint that negative onto glass. And when a sheet of parchment was placed behind that glass, it created the positive of that image. Taking the development process and, and all the other cumbersome tasks to getting that image out of the window. Now, in today's photography, digital age, I know a lot of photographers that couldn't even imagine having to process their images in this way. So back in the day when all they had was glass and clay plate production of an image, artists such as us, but 500, 600 years ago, they got tired of waiting or they got tired of the quality staying the same. So the evolution continued. After wet plate collodion, people began experimenting with different methods of how to bring that negative into a positive and how to imprint that image on more light sensitive material. That's when gelatin plates really came and got some speed. Gelatin plates allowed photographers to shoot at 60 times the speed of wet plate methods. The gelatin ended up being a much more light sensitive material to process these images onto, which created a much quicker developing process. From gelatin plates, we were gifted the marvels of film, y'all. The marvels of film. Film allowed people to take more than one photo at a time before developing those images. This allowed people to take their cameras and go somewhere to record or take their photos to a different destination to gather the events of that instance. They had to be mindful of the light, the motion of their camera, and the subject movement because that manipulated the image, but being able to record historical instances such as World War II or just the birth of someone's baby, having the ability to move around and take your camera somewhere else while still printing on the same realm of footage, same film, changed the game for photographers. It 
opened a huge new expanse for photographers of where you could go and what you could do and what you were able to imprint. So what happened next? Well, now that people were able to imprint multiple images at a time, photographers started experimenting with, well, I could probably show motion. I could probably put a bunch of images together and start showing someone moving. And this is where silent films were born because we can get the image on film by just taking a bunch of the same movements in a row, almost like still frame photography. This opened doors for photographers. This made the game so much bigger, so much ex more accessible to media artists. People were evolving in their craft. So after silent film was formed, genres started appearing in photography. People were taking portraits, landscapes, photojournalism really soared. The press and papers now had photojournalists on staff. They sent them off to site. Jobs were being created and ideas were being evolved from. So as film creators started making adjustments to the light sensitivity of the film that they were putting into their cameras, people were now able to evolve from black and white tones and really introduce color into their tones based on the sensitivity that film was to light. People started experimenting with how sensitive not only it was to light, but to color. That's when you start getting your sepia tones or adjusting your contrast or your saturation in hue. So that's why nowadays you can buy black and white film and color film. So in the digital age, the world we live in now, it is now a sensor inside of your camera that records the data or the metadata that creates the digital pixels of your image. Let's talk about the evolution of post-production within photography. Post-production involves the ability to manipulate an image after it is recorded. Post-production, such as Photoshop, was not available back in the 1800s or even back 2,000 years ago when Aristotle and his other Greek friends were talking about camera obscura. They had no idea that they could manipulate photos. So where did people start manipulating photos? Manipulation of photos started with the overlapping of multiple images on top of one another and then re-exposing those negatives without certain entities involved. But nowadays with the filters you can get on your phone or the different settings you can put on your DSLR camera, it's, it's just a normal thing now to manipulate photos other than what's inside the frame when you hit the shutter button. Post-production is something that you and I should not take for granted. Sometimes the manipulation aspect of photography removes that authenticity that photography works so hard to gain. It takes the image and puts in that doubt of, well, is that real? Is that really them walking out of that person's house? What a scandal. It takes the authenticity of photography out of it. So be mindful with your power of post-production. So this brings me to the idea of what does tomorrow's photography look like? Tomorrow's photography on the road that we're going on now is actually a very scary place to be. It's what's real and what's not real. Why don't I see that same color range in the night sky when I was there at the same time too? People are able to manipulate the objectivity and the realism of those photographs. It's not like when artists were using photography as a way to duplicate their product. It's now a, that's 
those aren't real colors or that's not really capable of someone to look that way or the image of what's beautiful it's a weapon to have post-production ability as a photographer you need to understand that responsibility try to separate yourself from just relying on your status or how many followers you have I know that's terrible to say here on a YouTube channel but be mindful of creating your own voice with your photography separating yourself because your eye is different from somebody else I know that in today's photography and tomorrow's photography your status has to be proven whereas back in the day if you came up with a new method of photography you were celebrated today follows almost true but you need to be mindful of what's going to separate you from someone else don't create fake news create new opportunities and new perspectives and new ways of just looking at the world in a different way that will set you apart and help this photography history continue to move forward in a positive way. What are your ways of evolving from the history of photography? What are some great ideas and evolutions that you know of within our craft? Make sure that your creative juices are flowing and that you make your mark on the world of photography. Love to hear it in the comments below. Until then, I'm Jane Corley with PicVision, Media Arts and Photography. If you learned something new, make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell so you can be notified every time a new video is uploaded. Until then, see you next time.